So now that we finally started to produce our full self-driving computer, we thought it's a good idea to just open the veil, invite everyone in, and talk about everything that we've been doing uh, for the past two years. If, if to, in order to have a self-driving car or a robo-taxi, you really need redundancy throughout the vehicle at the hardware level. Starting in, maybe it was October 2016, uh, all cars made by Tesla have redundant uh, power steering. If, if, a, if a motor fails, the car can still steer. All of the power and data lines have redundancy, so you can sever any given power line or any data line, and the car will keep driving. The, the whole system, is, from a hardware standpoint, has been designed to, for, uh, to be a robo-taxi since basically October 2016. So going after, going over just like Tesla, Tesla master plan, obviously we've made a bunch of forward-looking statements, as they call it. Um, <laughs> but let's go through some of our other forward-looking statements that we've made. You know, way back when we created the company, we said we'd build the Tesla Roadster. They said it was impossible, and that, and that even if we did build it, nobody would buy it. So we built the Tesla Roadster. Um, then we said we'd build a more affordable car with the, the Model S. We did that. And so we'd build a, 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 um, a, an affordable car, maybe highly affordable. It's affordable, more affordable, uh, with, with the Model 3. We built the Model 3, we're in production, um, and that we develop and deploy a solar roof, um, which is going really well. We're now in version 3 of the solar tile roof, and we made the Powerwall and PowerPack. In fact, the, the PowerPack is um, now deployed in massive grid-scale utility systems around the world. Only criticism, and it's a fair one, and sometimes I'm not on time. <laughs> so what we're going to do this year uh, is we're going to reach uh, combined production of 10,000 a week between SX and 3 feel very confident about that. Uh, and we feel very confident about being feature complete with self-driving. Next year, we'll expand the product line with Model Y and Semi. Uh, and we expect to have the first operating robo-taxis next year. Not in, all not in all jurisdictions, because we won't have regulatory approval everywhere. But I, I, I'm confident we'll have at least regulatory approval somewhere literally next year. Um, so any customer will be able to add or remove their car to the Tesla network. So we expect this to operate um, it's similar, it's sort of like a combination of maybe the Uber and Airbnb model. So if you own the car, you can add or subtract it to the Tesla network, and Tesla would uh, take uh, 25 or 30% of the revenue. Um, and, uh, and then in places where there aren't enough people sharing their cars, we would just have dedicated uh, Tesla vehicles. Um, so we'll sh we'll sh when you use the car, we'll show you our ride-sharing app. So you'll be able to, be able to summon the car from the parking lot, get in, and go for a drive. So you just take the same Tesla app that you currently have, we'll, just do an, we'll update the app and add a Summon, summon Tesla, or, or commit your car to the fleet. So it's either summon, summon your car, or add, summon a Tesla, or add, your, add or subtract your car to the fleet. You'll be able to do that from your phone. We'll do Model 3 S, S3 and X as taxis, but um, we, we made an important change to our leases. So if you lease a Model 3, you don't have the option of buying it at the end of the lease. We want them back. So the current cost of a Model 3 robo-taxi is um, Less than thirty-eight thousand dollars. Well, it's designed to operate for a million miles with minimal maintenance. Maintenance, and there's just really no, no company that has the full stack integration. We've got the, the vehicle design and manufacturing. We've got the computer hardware in-house. We've got the in-house software development um, the, and, and AI, and we've got by far the biggest fleet. It's extremely difficult, not impossible perhaps, but extremely difficult to catch up when Tesla has hundred times more um, miles per day than everyone else combined. You say, what would be the probable gross profit from a single robo-taxi? Um, we think probably something on the order of $30,000 per year. By the middle of next year, uh, we'll have over a million Tesla cars on the road with full self-driving hardware, feature complete, uh, at a reliability level that we would consider uh, that no one needs to pay attention. Meaning you could go to sleep in your, from our standpoint, we will have over a million robo-taxis on the road. I think we're, we'll tell you a little bit about how the whole thing got started, and then I'll introduce you to the full self-driving computer and tell you a little bit about how it works. So this whole program, from the hiring of the first few employees to having it in full production in all three of our cars, is just a little over three years, and is probably the fastest uh, system development program I've ever been associated with. Here's what it looks like. Uh, over there on the right, you see all the connectors for the video that comes in from our, the eight cameras that are in the car. You can see the two self-driving computers in the middle of the board, and then on the left is the power supply and some control connections. Here's the original hardware 2.5 enclosure that the computer went into, and we've been shipping for the last two years. Here's the new design for the FSD computer. It's basically the same, and that, of course, is driven by the constraints of having a retrofit program for the cars. As I said earlier, there's two fully independent computers on the board. 
Yeah, if I can add something, I mean, the general principle here is that it, any part of this could fail, and the car will keep driving. So uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about a neural network uh, from our narrow camera. It uses 35, giga, 35 billion operations, 35 giga ops. And if we use all 12 CPUs uh, to process that network, we could do one and a half frames per second, which is super slow, not nearly adequate to drive the car. If we use the 600 gigaflop GPU, uh, the same network, we'd get 17 frames per second, which is still not good enough to drive the car with eight cameras. The neural network accelerators on the chip can deliver 2,100 frames per second. And you can see from the scaling as we moved along that the amount of computing in the CPU and GPU are basically insignificant to what's available in the neural network accelerator. So moving on to results, we had a goal to stay under 100 watts. In terms of cost, the silicon cost of this solution is about 80% of what we were paying before. And in terms of performance, we took the narrow camera uh, neural network, which I've been talking about, that has 35 billion operations in it. We ran it on the old hardware as, uh, in a loop as quick as possible, and we delivered 110 frames per second. We took the same data, the same network, uh, compiled it for hardware for the new FST computer. Uh, and using all four accelerators, we can get 2,300 frames per second processed. I've never worked on a project where the performance increase was more than three. <laughs> if you compare it to, uh, say, NVIDIA's Drive Xavier solution, a single chip uh, delivers 21 teraops. Um, our full self-driving computer with two chips is 144 teraops. Um, I, th I think we've created a design that delivers outstanding performance, 144 teraops for neural network processing. It has outstanding power performance. We managed to jam all of that performance into the thermal budget that we had. It enables a fully redundant computing solution. It has a modest cost. And really, the important thing is that this FSD computer will enable a new level of safety and autonomy in Tesla's vehicles without impacting their cost or range. The reason I, I, I asked Pete to do just a, a detailed dive into the Tesla full self-driving computer is because it, 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 at first it seems improbable. How could it be that Tesla, who has never designed a chip before, would design the best chip in the world? But that is objectively what has occurred. Not, not best by a small margin, best by a huge margin. It's in the cars right now. All Teslas being produced right now have this computer. We switched over from the NVIDIA solution for SNX about a month ago, and we switched, switched over uh, Model 3 about 10 days ago. All cars being produced have the have all the hardware necessary, compute and otherwise, for full self-driving. And later today, you will drive the cars with the development version of the improved software, and you will see for yourselves. Uh, we care about one thing, self-driving. Um, so that it was designed to do that incredibly well. The software is also designed to run on that hardware incredibly well. Uh, and the combination of the software and the hardware, I think, is unbeatable. I mean, Andre is like really one of the best computer vision people in the world, arguably the best. My team is responsible for training of the, these neural networks, and that includes all of data collection from the fleet, neural network training, and then some of the deployment onto that chip. So the way we do this is we don't have labels like Iguana for images, but we do have images from the fleet like this, and we're interested in, for example, line markings. So we, a human typically goes into an image and using a mouse annotates the lane line markings. So here's an example of an annotation that a human could create a label for this image. So what's really critical is not just the scale of the data set. We don't just want millions of images. We actually need to do a really good job of covering the possible space of things that the car might encounter on the roads. So we need to teach the computer how to handle uh, scenarios where it's night and wet. You have all these different specular reflections, and as you might imagine, the brightness patterns in these images will look very different. Now, large and varied data sets make, basically make these networks work very well. This is not just a finding for us here at Tesla. This is a ubiquitous finding across the entire industry. Now, at Tesla, this is actually uh, a screenshot of our own simulator. We use simulation uh, extensively. The simulator, uh, simulations uh, have a lot of trouble with modeling appearance, physics, and the behaviors of all the agents around you. Uh, so there are some examples to really drive that point across. The real world really throws a lot of crazy stuff at you. A complicated construction sites that might feature lots of people, kids, animals, all mixed in, and simulating how those things interact and flow through this construction zone might actually be completely, completely intractable. It's not about the movement of any one pedestrian in there, it's about how they respond to each other and how those cars respond to each other and how they respond to you driving in that setting. Uh, and all of those are actually really tricky to simulate. And in some cases, it's not even that you can't simulate it, it's that you can't even come up with it. Yeah. So for example, I didn't know that you can have truck on truck on truck like that, but in the real world, you find this, and you find lots of other things. You don't know what you don't know. The world is very weird. And if, you, if, if somebody can pr produce a self-driving simulation that accurately matches reality, that in itself would be in a monumental achievement of, of, of human capability. I think the three points that I really tried to drive home until now are to get neural networks to work well, you require these three essentials. You require a large data set, a varied data set, and a real data set. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And if you have those capabilities, you can actually train neural networks and make them work very well. And so why is Tesla in such a unique and interesting position to really get all these three essentials right? And the answer to that, of course, is the fleet. Um, we can really source data from it and make our neural network systems work extremely well. I will mention that I talk quite a bit about sourcing data from the fleet. I just want to make a quick point that we've designed this from the beginning with privacy in mind, and all the data that we use for training is anonymized. We start with a seed data set that was potentially sourced at random. We annotate that data set, and then we train neural networks on that data set and put that in the car. And then we have mechanisms by which we notice inaccuracies in the car. That image would enter our unit tests so we can verify that we've actually fixing the problem over time. But now what you do is to fix this uh, inaccuracy, you need to source many more examples that look like that. So we ask the fleet to please send us many more tunnels, and then we label all those tunnels correctly. We incorporate that into the training set, and we retrain the network, redeploy, and iterate the cycle over and over again. Now, so far, I've talked about a lot of explicit labeling. Uh, so like I mentioned, we ask people to annotate data. Uh, this is an expensive process. So what I want to talk about also is really to utilize the power of the fleet. You don't want to go through this human annotation bottleneck. You want to just stream in data and automate it automatically. Um, and then we took this cut-in network and we deployed it to the fleet, but we don't turn it on yet. We run it in shadow mode. And in shadow mode, the network is always making predictions. Hey, I think this, this vehicle is going to cut in from the way it looks. This vehicle is going to cut in. And then we look for mispredictions. That ran in the shadow mode is making predictions. It makes some false positives, and there are some false negative detections. So we got overexcited in sometimes, and sometimes we missed a cut in when it actually happened. All those create a trigger that streams to us and that gets incorporated now for free. There's no humans harmed in the process of labeling this data. Incorporated for free into our training set, we retrain the network and redeploy the shadow mode. And so we can spin this a few times, and we always look at the false positives and negatives coming from the fleet. And once we're happy with the false positive, false negative ratio, we actually flip the bit and actually uh, let the car um, control to that network. So this is what we do when we initially have some algorithms we want to try out. We can put them on the fleet, and we can see what they would have done in a real-world scenario, such as this car that's overtaking us very quickly. And this is taken from our actual simulation environment, showing different paths that we have considered taking and how those overlay on the real-world behavior of a user. Kind of a complicated environment. So what you're seeing here is a video, and we are overlaying the, pr the predictions of the network. So this is a path that the network would follow um, in green. And some, yeah. I mean, the crazy thing is, the network is predicting paths it can't even see with incredibly high accuracy. It can't see around the corner, but it's, it, but it's saying the probability of that curve is extremely high, and so that's the path. So what I talked about so far is really the three key components of how we iterate on the predictions of the network and how we make it work over time. You require large, varied, and real data set. We can really achieve that here at Tesla, and uh, we do that through the scale of the fleet, the data engine, shipping things in shadow mode, iterating that cycle, and potentially even using fleet learning where no human annotators are harmed in the process and just using data automatically and we can really do that at scale. So in the next section of my talk, I'm going to especially talk about depth perception using vision only. So you might be familiar that there are uh, at least two sensors uh, in the car. One is vision, cameras, just getting pixels, and the other is LiDAR that a lot of, uh, that a lot of uh, companies also use. You all came here, you drove here, many of you, and you used your, <laughs> your uh, neural net and vision. You were not shooting lasers out of your eye. So here's a video going down, I think this is San Francisco. So this is the 3D reconstruction of those six seconds of that car driving through that path. And you can see that this information is purely, is, is very well recoverable. So in summary, people drive with vision only, no, no lasers are involved. This seems to work quite well. The point that I'd like to make is that visual recognition, and very powerful visual recognition, is, is absolutely necessary for autonomy. It's not a nice to have. Like we must have neural networks that actually really understand the environment around you. And, uh, and LiDAR points are a much less information rich environment. So vision really understands the full details. Just a few points around are, are much, um, there's much less information in those. So as an example on the left here, um, is that a plastic bag or is that a tire? A, a LiDAR might just give you a few points on that, but vision can tell you which one of those two is true and that impacts your control. Is that person who is slightly looking backwards, are they trying to merge in, into your lane uh, on the bike or are they just, uh, or are they just going forward? In the construction sites, what do those signs say? How should I behave in this world? The entire uh, infrastructure that we have built up for roads is all uh, designed for human visual consumption. All of autonomy, because you want level four, level five systems that can handle all the possible situations in 99.99% in of the cases. And chasing some of the last few nines is going to be very tricky and very difficult and is going to require a very powerful visual system. So I'm, I'm showing you some images of what you might encounter in any one slice of that nine. So in the beginning, you just have very simple cars going forward. Then those cars start to look a little bit funny. Then maybe you have bikes on cars. Then maybe you have cars on cars. Then maybe you start to get into really rare events like cars turned over or even cars airborne. We see a lot of things coming from the fleet. And we see them at some rate, at, at like a really good rate compared to all of our competitors. And so the rate of progress at which you can actually address these problems, iterate on the software, and really feed the neural networks with the right data 
that rate of progress is really just proportional to how often you encounter these situations in the wild. And we encounter them significantly more frequently than anyone else, which is why we're going to do extremely well.